Back at the beginning of July, we began a series looking at the first letter that Paul wrote. If you were to put Paul's letters chronologically, Galatians would be the first one he wrote. And we, uh, we know through some of the, the context and setting of the letter and some of the things happening in the New Testament that Paul wrote this letter sometime before the Council of Jerusalem happened in Acts 15. And so if you wanted a bit of a chronological reading, you got to stop somewhere in the chapters leading up to Acts 15, jump over to Galatians and read this letter. And so Paul wrote this letter to a group of churches in a geographical region. Galatia isn't a city, it's a, a region, it's an area. And Paul wrote this letter intending for it to be circulated amongst this grouping of churches. And so we're going to start today just by doing a little bit of a recap of where we have been so far in the first two chapters of Galatians, and then we're going to move forward. We're going to be looking through Galatians 3 and 4 and kind of looking at what is it that Paul is trying to teach and communicate to these people of Galatia. And so these churches he's writing to are churches that in many cases, Paul was the one who started them. Uh, One of his first missionary journeys took him through this region, and his practice was to go to the synagogues and preach that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the anointed one, that everything their scriptures had been pointing towards has now been fulfilled and happening in Jesus. And so there's these groups of uh, followers of Jesus forming in this region of Galatia. Now, Paul carries on, and he goes on to other cities and other places to teach, and then he starts getting some reports. He starts hearing word back that there's some other teaching starting to take hold in Galatia. And he starts getting reports hearing that these people are leading, uh, are teaching a message that is counter and against what Paul had been teaching. And so this kind of sets the conflict, kind of the issue that causes Paul to write this letter. He knows that he's not going to be able to get to Galatia right away or anytime soon, and so he writes a letter. And so uh, what we talked about in the first week of the series is that in the beginning of Galatians, Paul is laying a foundation in the letter to teach why it's critical that the integrity of the gospel of Jesus Christ is preserved. This false teaching that's popping up and taking root in Galatia needs to be stopped. And for Paul, he kind of writes this in terms of saying that the integrity of the gospel is at stake. And so Paul begins this letter by talking about kind of why he has the authority to write this letter and tell them that this group that's spreading this false teaching is wrong. And so he talks about his own conversion experience. He talks about his encounter with Jesus. And then he talks even a bit about some of the conflicts that he had with other church leaders about this issue and how that was resolved. And we know that this letter was written before the Council of Jerusalem because this issue was then addressed at the Council of Jerusalem. And so if Paul had been writing this after Acts 15, the events of Acts 15, he could have included that in saying, listen, this is what we decided. This is what happened when all the church leaders gathered in Jerusalem. And so Paul is kind of asking this question. This was the question that, that we asked of ourselves as we read this, of saying, even for us today, do we know the teachings of Jesus well enough to recognize when something has been added to Christianity? Do we know Jesus' teachings well enough that we, when we hear something, we go, wait, that doesn't sound like that matches. That doesn't sound like what Jesus had to say. And so this has been a constant issue through history. This is, you know, we're seeing right in the foundations of the early church that this issue around what is the gospel, what does it mean, how do we live it out, how do we recognize what is of the gospel is happening. And so if we skip ahead to Galatians 2, we kind of get what we would call almost Paul's thesis of the letter. This is the main point that he is building, and then the remainder of the letter is him kind of backing up and talking about the implications of this thesis. So Galatians 2, verse 16, uh, Paul writes this. He says, Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Jesus Christ so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. And so what he's saying here is there is this dichotomy happening between faith and the law. And that's what reveals what's happening in in this area of Galatia, is there's this group of people that we um, commentators and scholars have kind of given the title Judaizers to, and kind of defining that this is a group of people who are in the early church who are saying, if you want to follow Jesus, 
The first thing you have to do is learn to obey all of our Jewish law that dates all the way back to Moses. Saying, if you want to follow Jesus, Jesus was a Jew, he was a rabbi, he was brought up, he taught in the way of rabbis, so that means that we have to follow the law and then add Jesus' teachings on top. But this is what Paul is saying no to, of saying that when Jesus came, he didn't come to um, kind of carry on the law, he came to fulfill the law. And that's Jesus' own words from the Sermon on the Mount. He said, I came to fulfill the law, not to abolish the law. And so there is this tension happening between this group of teachers, and we're going to dive more into them and what this specific thing is they were trying to enforce uh, next week when we look at Galatians 5 and 6. But they're trying to tell these people who don't have a Jewish background, these Gentile Christians, of saying, well, if you want to follow Jesus, you got to become like us first. And Paul is saying no to that. Because what's really underneath this is Paul is saying, where are you putting your trust Is your trust found in your faith that you have in who Jesus is? Or are you needing to rely your faith upon the law that was given to Moses when the Israelites were in the wilderness? Which one are you choosing to base your foundation upon? Do you want to base it on Christ or do you want to base it on the law? And so we're going to skip ahead to Galatians 3. And so Galatians 3 and 4 is kind of the the theological underpinnings of Paul's argument. He starts saying, he's made his his statement, this is what I want to tell you, you don't have to follow the teachings of these Judaizers, you don't have to become Jewish to first, first before you become Christian. And so in Galatians 3 and 4, he's going to lay out, here's the theological reasons why. And so he begins this way, he says, Oh foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? And foolish here, he's not berating them. He's simply calling them not wise. And he says, who has cast an evil spell on you? Who is leading you astray is one of the ways some translations putting this. And Paul isn't blaming the Galatian churches for following this teaching. He's putting the blame securely on the people who are teaching that are leading them astray of saying, it's not your fault that you've been caught up in this, but it was not wise to follow them. And he says, for the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Paul is saying, when I was there, you understood this. You understood what Jesus' death and resurrection meant. It was plain and clear to you, and you put your faith in God. And, And Paul commends the Galatians for how they believed when he was first there in other parts of the letter. But now he's saying, you're following these people that are trying to teach you to go to the law of Moses. So Paul needs to build an argument against this. And so he goes to something older than the Mosaic law. As he tells them, you don't have to follow the law, he goes to Abraham. And he goes to Abraham, who lived before the Israelites were even known as the people of Israel, who goes to before they were in Egypt, before Even when Abraham only had his wife and had no children at all, God met with him. And so Paul refers to that moment, and he says, In the same way, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham, then, are those who put their faith in God. And so when he says the real children of Abraham, he's kind of using part of this group of Judaizers' argument against them because they're claiming that they are the real children of Abraham, that by following this group of teachings that they have created, they're the ones who can trace what they're doing back to Abraham. And they're doing that through the law of Moses. But Paul's saying, no, 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 the real children of Abraham are those who put their faith in God. And so... um, Paul goes then and he carries on in this. He says, what's more, the scriptures look forward to this time when God would declare the Gentiles to be righteous because of their faith. And the Gentile is just anyone who doesn't have Israelite or Jewish ancestry. He says, God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. So Paul is setting up this this second way of understanding what God did in Genesis 12. 
He's saying it's not just those who can trace their biological ancestry through their family line back to Abraham that are included in who God calls righteous. Because of Christ, that is open to everyone. And so if we flip all the way back to Genesis 12, to when God encounters Abram and then later renames him Abraham, God says this, he says, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. This covenant, um, and a, a little bit later in this, God formalizes this promise to Abraham in a covenant. God is making this claim to him. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. It's like God is saying, what I'm starting with you now in this moment, Abram, is going to affect and shape the entire world. Every family on earth, every person who ever lives will benefit because of what God is starting in this moment. And so this is what Paul is anchoring his argument in. He's saying, this isn't about the law of Moses. This isn't about the way that when the Israelites came out of Egypt and into the promised land and they didn't know how to be a people group. They had been slaves for so long that they didn't even know how to structure it, how to govern themselves, how to be. And so when they come out of Egypt and they're in the wilderness, God meets Moses on the mountain of Mount Sinai and he gives them the Ten Commandments and he gives him the law and God gives the people, this is what it means to follow me. But even in all of their law, there was always this understanding that their existence as a people group was meant to reveal God to the world around them. This talk of all the families on earth will be blessed through you is found throughout how the Israelites were commanded to interact with their neighbors, to care for the poor, to shepherd and help lead people. And now, thousands of years later, Paul is writing to the Galatian churches and he's reminding them of this. That this isn't just about the law. This is about what God promised to Abram. And it finally came to fruition and became part of God's plan and became active through what Jesus did when he was on earth, through his death, through his resurrection, through his teaching. This is the fulfillment of what God promised to Abraham. And so Paul is basically countering these Judaizers by saying, no, no, it's not about the law. It's about what happened before the law. And so to explain this, Paul uses a metaphor. He says, before the, the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. And he, he carries on in this metaphor a little later in, in Galatians and even uses this, you know, this, imagine a child who is under the age where they're considered an adult and their parent passes away and their inheritance is held in trust for them until they are of age to take that and to be able to manage it and use it to live for themselves. And so essentially this is foster care is what, what Paul is describing what God has done. The law was there to be a temporary guardian, to be a way of showing, here's how you can live in a relationship with God. But the law points forward to Jesus. And even in the last sermon series we did, the Life of David, the, the partnership series we did with Morden, that was one of the things that we kept seeing in that, that the events of David's life and even the covenant that God made with David were all foreshadowing what God was still yet to do. At no point in the covenants is there, this is the end. It, they were always pointing towards what was, for, what was coming next. And so Paul is talking about this covenant that is made through Christ's death and resurrection, how that creates this way of us being declared right in God's eyes because of faith, not because of what we've done. And so Paul carries on his argument, and he summarizes, and he starts to talk about, so what does this mean? What does it mean that the way of faith has come 
And that is how we are made right with God. And so he says in the next verses, verse 26 and 27, he says, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. Paul is saying that everyone who comes to faith in Christ Jesus is a child of God. It's no longer about saying, are you a child of Abraham? Like, can you trace your family line back to Abraham? No, if you have come to faith in God, that is part of your identity now. You are known to God as a child of God. That's our, the identity that's given to us because of faith. And when that identity is given to us through faith, that means as a child of God, we are the, the, the people who receive the inheritance that God promised to Abraham. This promise that all the families on earth would be blessed through you is a promise that then carries on to us. Now, that's not just a promise, that's a request. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Part of our inheritance as being known as a child of God means that that task of representing God to the world so that all families on earth will be blessed is part of what it means to accept that inheritance of salvation, to accept that inheritance of righteousness. It also means that task. How are we partnering with God? How are we partnering with the Holy Spirit? How is God working through us, through our actions? How is our love shaping the world? is part of that inheritance. And Paul goes one further with this. He says, your identity is now found in Christ. You are a child of God. And baptism is this outward declaration of what is an inward transformation, this outward declaration of what God is doing in your life. And back in June, we had two baptisms and we had two people share their, their story, their testimony of how their lives were being changed and why they were making this declaration of baptism. And in the early church, um, baptism was oftentimes, by about the second century, we have some early church documents that have been preserved, that baptism had become a year-long process of learning and teaching and preparing and helping people understand. And part of why baptism in that second century became such a long process was because of issues that Paul is talking about, is talking about this false teaching and people having, you know, different understandings of the gospel and needing to come back to the core. And so baptism became this opportunity of of how do we share that teaching? How do we help people have good theology around who God is? Because that theology theology shapes their actions and choices and who they are. Paul says, when you take on this identity, something else happens too. And so the next two verses are maybe two of, the, of probably some of the most quoted verses of Galatians, where Paul says this. He says, There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Now that first line there of saying there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female. He's not saying that those distinctions just cease to exist. But what he's saying is no matter what your standing is, no matter what your background is, no matter who you are, you are equal before God as a child of God. So if you're Jewish, have Jewish ancestry, or if you don't, that doesn't matter before God. If you are slave or free, that doesn't matter before God. If you are male or female, that doesn't matter before God. And this is what was something that was so revolutionary about the early church, is in an economy and a world that was dominated by slavery, the early Christian churches were the only place where people who were slaves and people who were free interacted and saw each other as equals. Now, it would be centuries and thousands of years, and we still live in a world where slavery is happening. We haven't eradicated slavery yet, even though it's something that we should hopefully all be working towards in some way and understanding that that's where we want our world to go. God is not saying that slavery is endorsed by this, but he's saying no matter what your standing is, no matter where you are in society, you are equal before God. You are equal heirs in what God has done. 
See, this group of the Judaizers was saying that there is classes of followers of Jesus, that the people who followed their teaching were superior to all those others who just followed Jesus halfway. And Paul is saying that is not the case. And so, Paul carries on in his argument here. And he's saying, what does this lead to? Where does this take us, this ending of social divides, this finding our identity in Christ? Well, Paul is still dealing with this issue that this false teaching is spreading in the Galatian churches. And so he comes back to this. He says in Galatians 4, verse 8 and 9, Before you Gentiles knew God, or you were slaves to so-called gods that do not even exist. So now that you know God, or I should say now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of this world? Paul's talking about idolatry. He's saying before you knew Jesus, you were worshiping these idols made of stone and metal and wood. And you were caught in this worldview that said, I have to appease these idols if I want good things to happen to me. And every form of paganistic, animistic religion like that, any type of that spirituality, always has some sort of a cause and effect being tied to it. And it's this worldview that if something bad happens to you, well, that's because you didn't worship your idol well enough. Or if something good happens, well, that's because you did worship your idol well enough, so you better keep that up. And Paul is saying those are the spiritual principles of this world. That's what is surrounding them in their culture. And Paul's saying, why do you want to go back to that and calls it equivalent to slavery? He says, now that you know God, or should I say, now that God knows you, now that you have come into this relationship with God, and this to know is not just an intellectual assent. This isn't just a head knowledge. Uh, Paul is actually borrowing a Hebrew understanding of the word know, where it's a deeper relationship, relationship type of language. It's an intimate relationship of knowing one another deeply. He says, now that you know God, deep, God deeply, and now that God knows you deeply, because everyone is equal before God, why do you want to go back to a system where you are forced to follow rules and principles, and there's this whole transactional piece of it. Why do you want to go back to that? And he carries this on. He says, you are trying to earn favor with God by observing certain days or months or seasons or years. I fear for you. Perhaps all my hard work with you was nothing, dear brothers and sisters. I plead with you to live as I do in freedom from these things. For I have become like you Gentiles, free from those laws. Paul is saying that because of our identity, because of faith in Christ, because we are called co-heirs of the blessing given to Abraham, the blessing that goes back to the beginning of the Torah, why are we wanting to go back to systems of rules that restrict us? Why would we want to go back to that way of understanding the world rather than living in a relationship that is defined by love and uh, a close relationship with God? And so Paul, through Galatians 3 and 4, keeps repeating this argument in different ways. It's almost like he's trying to preemptively guess what are their criticisms going to be when they receive this letter? And taking as many ways as he can through these two chapters to try to make this clear, hoping that one of these explanations will stick in the minds of the people of Galatia and it will lead them to understand, oh, this is about God's love for us. This is about our identity being shaped by God's love. This isn't about finding a new system of rules that guards our life. This is about relationship. The gospel always leads to relationship, not legislation. And so Paul is trying to get them to understand this. Now, we don't have any of the letters that went back to Paul, whether those were letters written or whether those were messengers sent from these places to go and give Paul a report of what was going on. We don't know what their response was. But we can assume that there would have been some debate around this. When this letter comes, some people would accept it and go, oh, right, this is what Paul taught us when he was here in person. 
And part of Galatians 4, Paul reminds and thanks the Galatians for how they cared for him, that he was having some sort of a vision eye problem when he arrived. And he said, you took such great care of me, and I'm so grateful for that. You didn't dismiss what I had to say because of my physical condition that I was dealing with at that time, whatever it was. But he thanks them for that. But we can understand that there was probably some debate. And so we might have this question of saying, well, how do we know that what Paul is saying here is true? If we were to put ourselves in the shoes of those Galatians and say, this letter has come from Paul, and some people are saying, oh, yeah, this is exactly what Paul was teaching us before. Man, we've been led astray. And some people are like, no, 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 I think this Judaizer group, they know what they're talking about. Paul's the one that's out to lunch. How do we know which one we're going to follow? And I think it's pretty clear by how I've been talking that I think we should follow Paul's take on this problem rather than the Judaizers. But the question might come to us, how do we decide what's true when there's some sort of debate, there's some sort of you know, conversation happening about the gospel? How do we figure out which one is of God? How do we figure out which one's true? And I'm not going to get into that today because that's what Paul is going to take us into in Galatians 5 and 6. He's going to dive into this, how do we figure out what is true? Because he doesn't want to just give them the answer and say, here's the answer to your problem, follow this. Because if he's doing that, he's just giving them a system of rules and laws. Instead, in Galatians 5 and 6, Paul wants to give them the tools and the understanding for how to figure out what is true themselves. And so that's kind of the the foreshadowing of next Sunday, and I hope you'll be here to join us for that. But to summarize this, Galatians 3 and 4, this, this part of this letter that we've been studying and looking through, Paul is encouraging the Galatian churches to hold on to the gospel by experiencing and embracing the fullness of God's love for everyone. This isn't about a system of rules. This is about understanding that God's love for each one of us is the love that a parent has for their child, is the love that carries this promise, but also this request and this task for us as his followers of saying, how are we carrying forward the blessing that we have received by our relationship with God, and how are we carrying that forward into our world? How are we part of partnering with the Holy Spirit and working for our world to be transformed so that people have the opportunity to know who Christ is? How are we making choices that leads to reducing suffering, to reducing slavery, to reducing the issues of poverty and justice? How part of that blessing that the whole earth will be shaped by God carries that task for us as well? So that's a question to leave us with. As we have experienced and embraced the fullnesses of God's love for us, how do we make choices and how do we talk about our faith, and how do we have conversations with people that maybe aren't even about faith, but are still filled with the Holy Spirit, to help people recognize God's love for them. Let me close by praying for us. God, thank you for your scriptures. Thank you that Paul had the foresight to write this, and and people through the early church had the the foresight to preserve these things so that we could have them today, and, and see this picture of what was happening, how Even in the early church, there was difficulty, there was turmoil, there was problems, but also that we can see your faithfulness through that. God, thank you for the presence of your spirit with us, guiding us, revealing your love to us, your goodness that we sang about earlier. And so God, this week I pray that you would give us both opportunities and the recognition to see when you are presenting us opportunities to show your love to others. That just as we have come into faith in you through your grace and through the gospel and through your love for us, may we be people that reveal your love and your grace to those around us. God, would you give us the opportunities for that? Would you help us see those opportunities and to speak with an empowerment of your Holy Spirit in those moments that those around us would know who you are and the depth of your love for them? In your name we pray, amen. So folks, next Sunday, we're going to wrap up into Galatians 5 and 6 and dive more into that. So I hope you'll plan to be here. And uh, remember, this Wednesday, uh, Kids Own Meeting, and then September 11th is our fall kickoff. So hope to see you next Sunday and Sunday after. Take care.